So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody who's uh, virtually attending. Um, so my name is Jason Pufal. I'm the CISO for the University of Connecticut. And you know, as I as I go through this, I've done this presentation a, a few times. Uh, we've been we've been doing this this program for the better part of two years now. So if you've got questions as we as we kind of progress, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to you know engage in more of a dialogue than just talk for an hour. So you know, feel free. Um, I'll, I'll sort of set the stage of how you know why we started this. About two years ago, uh, the foundation, the university foundation, approached me and said that they had about $5,000 in a fund that was donated uh, with the express purpose of training students in some fashion, right, as, as it relates to information security. So I had a, I had a funding source to sort of kick this off um, in, in a really specific uh, directive. The, I sat down with a few people, student affairs primarily, and started brainstorming about what we may want to do. And, and it was pretty quick for us all to decide that, you know, we didn't want to just send out you know, email and, and do a couple of videos. And some of the things that I think we've traditionally done with, with fairly mixed success. So we kind of said, well, you know, in what way do the students engage most regularly? And, and you know, social media certainly seemed to be the most, uh, kind of the most obvious, right? So the, what, what we decided was we would try to build something that at least took advantage of that, right? So in, in leverage social media to get our message out more effectively. Um, but at the same time, we wanted that to be, you know, meaningful. Right, we wanted, the, we wanted this experience to be as interactive as possible. Um, if we're gonna put the effort into it, we wanted it to be something that we could repeat. Uh, so to this point, we have done it four times, I believe, in, no, three times, I'm sorry, in total. So we've, we've run it a variety of times, and we're, and we're trying to actually uh, try different, different ways to see which is most successful. And I'll go through that as I, as I work through the presentation. Um, I think one of the things that does make this unique is that it's fairly innovative, right? We, we're trying to educate people through an online game that can actually assess to a degree what they've learned, um, leverage social media to get the, to get the word out in a, in to, into a broader audience, um, but then also sort of bring this into the, into the physical space and, and have the students engage in a, an actual scavenger hunt. Um, the game is primarily held online. We have not developed a mobile app, uh, but it's mobile friendly, right? So, you know, any device uh, works fairly well with it. Um, and we have a, a kind of a variety of, you know, what, what we call incentives. Uh, we weren't officially allowed to call them prizes for whatever reason. So we've got a variety of incentives that we, that we have. Um, the first, the, the, the grand incentive of the first prize is $500 uh, gift certificate to the Yukon Co-op. Typically, right, I thought would be they use it for books with some hope. Uh, then there's a second and third place, and then a variety of other sort of giveaways throughout the, throughout the contest. Um, that's just a look at the front page of the website. Um, it's, it's improved over time. We've engaged a, <clears throat> a group on campus. We've got a, a digital media program on campus. So we've actually engaged the students in that program to help us with some of the sort of some of the marketing, some of the um, website design. I'm hopeful that in the upcoming semester they'll be more heavily involved as it relates to sort of the game design itself. I think the game, while it works fairly well, uh, has a few uh, flaws that I think we need to work out. And I'll speak to those as we go through it. I don't think I'm, there we go. Um, so this is just a, a, an overview on, on what the game looks like in, in, in a really simple step, right? So you want to picture the, the game itself essentially as uh, two stages, right? There's the initial um, question and answer piece that's done online, right? So it's, we send out a message to all the students who've actually enrolled. Uh, we've got all that information because we, we actually can, you know, we leverage our university, you know, uh, net ID obviously for, you know, for access. Uh, so we've got the, the people who play. Um, so we send out email. If they actually provide us their uh, social media um, identifier, right, we'll communicate them through that as well. But typically, that's, that's probably 50-50. Not everybody wants to do that right out of the gates. Um, we'll send them an information that that week's question has started or that day's question has started. Give them op an opportunity to uh, read through it, do the question and answer. And then they'll have an opportunity to to essentially post or tweet or whatever to Facebook or Twitter a pre-canned message that we'll set up, right? So if, it, if it's a, if the module that week is related to, um, you know, password management, after they complete their initial um, question and answer, 
they'll be presented with a dialog box that'll say, you know, please use uh, strong passwords, right? Create strong passwords. That'll, that'll get posted out and ideally, right, our hope here is that those people who aren't playing the game actually have an opportunity to see some basic security awareness messages, right? Um, once they get that, they'll be presented essentially with the second stage of that module, which, which is the scavenger hunt portion, right? An actual on-campus scavenger hunt. Uh, the, the hope there, and, and quite honestly, I don't think it's, it's truly materialized this way, but the hope is that uh, we'll have you know, hordes of kids running around looking for things creatively placed on campus. Um, you know, hordes might be a little bit aggressive. I think we have a, a couple of people strolling about looking for things, but, it w but I, I certainly wouldn't say our engagement has been that significant yet. Um, and then they, fi they find the, the place, the location that we've asked them to go to. They'll then have, you know, they'll locate whatever the poster is. We put a poster everywhere. Um, they can use a QR code to either scan in to, to verify that they've been there or they can actually, you know, type in uh, the message there. And again, another opportunity for them to, to tweet or post to Facebook what the security message will be. Um, so that's a, I think that's the, you know, that's the high level concept of the game. Uh, you'll see at the bottom there that we've got a variety of, of vendors. What we've, what we've done is partner now with, with some of the local businesses to, to sort of draw them in. And, and I'll speak to sort of why we've done that and, and how, that, how, that has, uh, how that's gone over time. So that's just a picture of, of somebody standing in front of, I think, I think Husky Pizza, if I recall. Um, you know, had, having found the poster and in preparing to scan it in, so. Uh, to date, we've covered topics generally around this. I think we've added a couple. We just ran another, another one-week version of the game um, in April. I think it was April 14th that it started. So we've actually added a couple of here. But, you know, we really tried. The, the focus for us really specifically was identify topics that were relevant relevant and useful to students in their everyday lives, right? So it wasn't about me as a CISO trying to find things that I felt the university would be beneficial in teaching. I really wanted to make this as practical as, as I could for the students, right? So a lot of it really is, you know, behavior on or, or as it relates to social media, right? What to post, what not to post, the understanding that, you know, when you take pictures and you put them up there, that gives you, you know, location-based information how to do some basic password management, right? How to understand how to interact with the financial websites that they may or may not be going to. Um, how to identify phishing, right? Things that are relevant in everyday life. Uh, the feedback has been pretty good, I would say, so far. The, honestly, the criticism that we've had has been that um, our questions typically have been probably too easy. So we really went down the road initially of a, of a true and false um, style question and answer. Um, I think the questions are just too easy, and we've got designs on making them more complicated, but we really wanted to go through a couple of iterations of this to see what our engagement would be and get a sense. Um, it was really interesting when, when people were saying that they wanted the game to be more challenging, and I think what it was is your top people really want a way to differentiate themselves from the people that they're actually competing with rather than make this as easy, um, kind of as easy as we have done so far. So that's really going to be a key for us going forward is trying to make this game more challenging uh, make the make the locations that they need to find probably more challenging if possible um, and, and, and kind of go from there. So, and I think, you know, the reason I, I put this up here is every time I've spoken about this, one of the major questions that we do get is, you know, what are you training people on? And, and you know, how did you identify what the, what the questions were? Um, we reached out to students for a lot of these. So we've got a, a fairly significant uh, student staff for just student-based technical support, right? We've got a... a uh, student affairs run organization. I think they've got almost 130 students who work for them who specifically do technical support, right? So they're the ones who are engaged with students every day. They're the ones who, who have a sense for where their challenges are. So we really reached out to them. Uh, certainly we guided them, right? There's some things that I specifically did want to include, but the reality is a lot of this was generated specifically from student, in, student engagement. Um, pick, this is really a framework, right? The, the, the application itself allows us to embed essentially whatever content we want in it. So we've developed some of our own, our own videos uh, that we created. I think we have maybe four or five videos that we've created in-house that are, that are very specific and relevant to the content that we want to train on, that uh, references and leverages you know, UConn and, and the, you know, the store's location so that it, it sort of drives, that, the, drives it home that we've actually done it. Um, we've certainly leveraged content that we found online. I mean, there's tons of stuff out there, right? Some of it's, you know, fun and engaging. Some of it's kind of dry and boring. We leverage both. Um, 
but it's, re it's a really good framework for, for, you, for us to be able to embed information and actually distribute that. The, and I don't think, I think I took the slide out, so I'm going to go back up one more. Um, one of the things that actually was handy for this was uh, there was a zero-day Internet Explorer um, issue at one point, and we were running the game while that was going on, and we actually leveraged that as an opportunity for at least those individuals that were playing it to basically have a question and answer around you know, zero days and something specific to that, to that actual vulnerability. So we, wherever we can, we sort of we leverage this as an opportunity to get even additional information out, and that's actually worked fairly well a couple of different times. Um, another nice thing that we did, and I don't believe I have it up here anymore, VPC. Oh, yeah, up top there. So we've got a, uh, a pretty large deployment, uh, a VDI, virtual desktop uh, deployment, for students to use so they have access to, you know, course-specific software. And as that organization, there's, you know, a half dozen people, and they're responsible for, for delivering that service. Um, they leveraged Husky Hunt to actually, you know, get more access to students so they could actually distribute their messages out as well, right? With some basic Q&A around how do you interact with it, how do you download the client and install it, right? So, so as much as this is a security framework, um, as we've gone through the last couple of years, we've had people ask us to, you know, to use, the, to use our medium as a way to deliver their message. And, and quite honestly, I'm perfectly happy to do that, right? Because if I can increase engagement and if I can increase people's interest in, in this game, then I have a better opportunity to deliver my message ultimately anyway. So it's, it's completely worthwhile. I talk fairly quickly sometimes. So does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we've also, like I said, we partnered with the, the Asian group, which is that the digital media group on campus. I think there's about 50 students in that program right now. Um, and as you expect, right, 10 of them are incredibly engaged and 40 of them you know, aren't so much. But, but the reality is it's 10 people who are actually looking to try and improve, the, improve upon the design that we've created to date. So it's really been great for us. Um, where I think we fell short, the security office fell short the first year, was really in the, uh, in the, husk, in, in the scavenger hunt portion, right? It's a lot of work to manage. It takes a fair amount of time to walk around, to put your posters up, to create the to kind of create the, 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 the locations that you want and then you know, all the associated clues to get people there. And I think what we found was that it didn't really aid that much in delivering our message, right? So I thought it would be, quite honestly, that my, my original thought was, you know, that's going to be the coolest part of the game, right? Everybody's going to want to run around and do the scavenger hunt and you know, they're going to go out Thursday night before they go out drinking and they're going to do the scavenger hunt and it's going to be great. And they didn't, right? Um, we also which you don't expect, right? Uh, we had a hurricane on one of them, which promptly blew all of our posters off of everywhere we put them. So, you know, students would walk around and, you know, they'd find a poster on the ground and scan it there, and they'd find one somewhere else on campus and scan it there. And the people who didn't find it, right, were all angry because they didn't get their points. So you, you kind of realize like, that was, that was more work than, than I think we had initially uh, anticipated. Um, but the great news was after we ran this the first, the first year, um, our Husky One Card office approached us and said, you know, we're really trying to drive people out to the businesses that accept the Husky Bucks program, right? We've, they've got their student ID, they can essentially add money to it, and they can go buy, you know, pizza and things like that. So they said, can, can, we, be, can we be the people who actually leverage your, your scavenger hunt portion and drive people out? So they now manage that fully. So all I'm responsible for at this point really is the security content for that first part of the, of the, of the program they deal with all of the vendor relationships. They deal with identifying who actually wants to participate. Um, they'll manage whenever possible to get the posters out there. You know, we, we certainly work with them if they need, to, if they need help. But um, typically, once they arrive at the location, we'll still have a security message. But largely, that part of the program is designed to, to kind of teach students you know, what's available to them, both on campus and off campus, where they can use some of the um, features of the card, kind of what the card does. That's really been helpful for us for sort of for two reasons. The first is it took that second half of the game. It allowed us to keep, to keep doing the scavenger hunt, but it also took the burden off of us. Um, and they were actually looking to do a, a essentially a scavenger hunt style program. There's, there's, a, there's an app 
that, you know, that allows you to do some scavenger hunt stuff. So it also enabled us not to have a competing scavenger hunt going on, which I think also would have just driven people away from what we were trying to do. So ultimately, I think we've, we've created a better product because of that. We've reduced some of our work, and I think we've reduced it and ha haven't actually lessened our, our effectiveness at all. So you know, I think it's, it, it was a win across. Um, every one of the partners, I'll call them partners, right? Every one of the vendors that we leverage does some sort of a giveaway for the first, you know, somewhere between say 10 and 25 people who arrive. So our goal is, you know, get this message out and then start getting people there as quickly as possible. And, and you know, they time it, right? The, the, the burger place, we would announce at, you know, roughly noon, right? Because it wouldn't make sense to do that at 8 a.m., right? Um, so we try to be, we try to pay attention to the, to the, to the people that we've got. Um, that's clearly pretty effective. You know, people will do a fair amount of work for, for a free burger or for a coffee or whatever the case is. Um, it's really interesting when we did Big Y, which is a grocery store about five miles from campus. And the, the whole purpose of, the, of them doing the grocery store was to educate the students that there was a bus system that brought them down to, you know, sort of another part of town where there were things. Um, people were irate that they had to get on the bus and go somewhere. Uh, I never expected the, the, the public outcry that I got by asking them to take a bus ride, you know. So this, I'll do it again. I mean, I don't think that it, it's not that important, but it was really interesting to see, you know, the things that I think will work versus with the reaction that students have, right? They simply didn't want to leave campus. Um, but the vendors have been really helpful, and I think um, it's, it's, it, it's enabled us to do a variety of different incentives throughout the program as well, right? So rather than everything simply being uh, something that was funded either out of that original uh, security fund that I that I spoke about, or you know, since uh, since then I've obviously you know funded it a little bit differently. But um, it gives me another opportunity to to create you know prizes for for people. <clears throat> um, I think, with the exception of the pizza place, everybody said that they would do it again. Um, at the day of the of the day of the scavenger hunt, people arrived at the pizza place and they promptly turned them all away and said they actually didn't want people there even though they had agreed to participate. So there's a variety of hurdles that you, you know, that, that you kind of have to work through as the game goes on. So we actually just had somebody stand outside with a poster rather than putting it on their window and dealt with it that way. But you've got some awkward things, you know, that, that happen that you just don't expect. Um, so there's two pieces of this that were a fair amount of work, right? The, the initial application development. Uh, and, and actually, I'm going to point to this at the end, but I'll, I'll bring it up now as well. Um, all of this is available if anybody wants it, right? So all of the content that we've created, uh, we've got packaged and it's available. The application's open source and it's fairly, should be fairly straightforward to implement if anybody wants to, so you can take advantage of that. There'll be references at the end to the, to the GitHub site so you can grab that. Um, it was designed with the idea that we, that we can distribute this. So that's really the entire intention of this, is to give you an idea of how it works and hopefully uh, entice you to play it. And I'll give you some of the ideas, of, the, the ideas I have for longer term um, uh, opportunities here, but but I don't want to trivialize it. It's a fair amount of work, right? I, I can give you the application. That part's done. Um, what I can't do for you is you know market it and distribute posters and get the awareness out there, and that's and that's work. Um, to give you a sense for it, right? We do some of the traditional stuff, right? We send we send email out. We put um, um, updates on that, on kind of the, the university central listserv that then turns into a web page, right? So we get information out there. Um, how broadly, how broadly consumed that is, I can't really say. We put table tents on every single dining hall table, uh, typically the week before the event starts. So we we kind of feel like there's a captive audience there. Um, clearly, the campus newspaper. Um, any any kind of fair or event that exists, we'll typically do that. So we'll engage with our fraternities and sororities as they go through, you know, whatever you know, whatever events that they have to try and get the word out that way. Uh, we'll plant people in the student union to get people who are as they're passing by. Uh, we put placards at the bookstore so that as people are buying books or kind of in there, they see it. Um, we. Did have a, yeah, we had an advertisement on the, the kind of the movie theater screen, you know, as, they, as movies were to begin. Um, but it's work. And, you know, it's really interesting. You, it, when I get through the numbers, there's a fair amount of this presentation that describes um, sort of the, the involvement and the engagement in the numbers, right? Um, they're not as good as I would think. Considering the amount of effort that we've actually put in to try, and, to try to raise awareness for it, it's amazing how few people we actually get. And it, you know, it's multiple hundreds. It's not like it's 10. But it's... it's you know, we're, we're a school of you know, over 30,000 people. Um, 
I would expect to have, you know, my, my original hope for, for, the, first, for the first year was 1,000. Uh, we hit that, but it's, but it's a huge lie, and I'll, I'll describe why. But um, we haven't seen the numbers that I had hoped. It is work to get the information out. But you have to do it, right? Um, we put posters up. Uh, this is just one example of them, but you know, posters up all over the place. You know, again, you know, the, the most common locations that people tend to convene, we try to do that. Uh, but the downside is that you know, when the game is over, you have to go take your posters down. And you know, that takes time, too. So you have to factor all that stuff into it. Um, I hired four students, typically, each time we run it. Um, they're fairly short. So the first game that we ran was seven weeks. The second game was six weeks. And the last one we did was one week. And, and as I go through the numbers, you, it'll be interesting. I think to you that a that a one week game was nearly as effective as a six week game, and and I think the the ability for students to sort of wrap their their head around doing a one week game, and find a way to schedule that is much easier. So we'll speak to that as well. Um, we paint to the rock, right? We've got a rock on campus that everybody paints. I think the rock was probably this big 25 years ago, and now it's you know now it's that big. Um, yeah, you know, we that that was painted by that Asian group. It lasted about 12 hours before a fraternity then promptly painted over it. So, you know, that's another one of those challenges, right? You go through the effort of doing it um, only to see it last for 12 hours. It could have been four days, right? You've certainly seen things last that long. So we kind of, uh, we didn't get the, the exposure there that we had hoped that as well. Um, we're going to try to turn this more into a class project for that Asian group uh, rather than have it be, you know, help if you can. I think the goal here would be to actually identify it as one of their, you know, two or three project opportunities and see if we can get some, some legitimate and official engagement that way. Uh, we have a program called the, you know, the Freshman Year Experience, and I think we're going to, to involve ourselves in that more. We do have some faculty in computer science who actually want to add this or, or make it a requirement for some of their classes. So we're seeing now some, some faculty engagement, which is really great. Uh, you know, Greek life, a few are great and a few don't care at all, but we've certainly had some engagement there, which has been really nice. Um, some of them have actually required that for their pledges as they go through it. So, you know, there's, there's some different opportunities there, right? And, you know, Army ROTC, it was interesting when we approached them, they just treated it like, you know, it should be mandatory institutionally, so they just had all their guys do it, right? So, um, depending on the group you go after, uh, you certainly get a different response. Um, so here's, here's a sense of, of what, we've, what we've seen for some numbers. Um, the, the, the graph on the left here represents the first year. And, you know, I think, you know, what, what stands out, obviously, is that we've got more female than male players. Um, about 1,500 people, roughly, right? Um, this is the, whoops, this is the second year. So you can see the numbers are very different, right? So if we've got about 1,500 people here, and we've got, you know, about 500 there in the second year. Um, and there's the, there's the exact numbers. The 1,500 is, is just not accurate. So we actually had 1,500 people sign up. What happened was, and this is another good thing to think about, I was disappointed with the, with the turnout after, say, the first, that maybe the first or second week, where I really felt that I'd see a, a kind of a bigger participation level. So we sort of met and decided, you know, we're going to offer a referral program. We're going to let people, uh, if they, I think if they had referred either 10 or 15 people, right, we'd give them a, we'd give them a coupon for an ice cream at the dairy bar. And um, we didn't really think it through particularly well. So yes, people referred and lots of people joined, but nobody played at all, right? Because it was simply an opportunity for the, for one, I, mean, I have to give her credit, one girl who managed, who had you know, tons and tons and tons of friends to refer hundreds of people, get tons of ice cream coupons, and then promptly have nobody actually play the game. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good example of, of sort of, you know, changing your directions midstream only to realize that, you know, you really needed to think that through better, right? Um, 567, though, is a real number. So the second year when we, when we actually went through this, we had 567 people sign up and actually play the game. Of those, the people who went through it entirely, right, we only had 17 people that first year. We were up to 82 the second year. Um, still not staggering numbers, right? So you figure sometime within the, between the first week and, say, the sixth week, right, we lost the majority of our players both times, right? Um, but 82 was better, and I think it was encouraging enough for us to see, even throughout the game, right, the, the, the increase in participation in general. Um, in, we also saw more people play, you know, 
play at least a module, right? Um, again, not staggering numbers, but we're seeing an increase, and I think people are starting to understand what the game's all about. This is, this is probably, for me, one of the most interesting slides, though. So the first year that we, that we created the game, we made it mandatory that you either had to follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook, and you had to retweet. Um, I didn't understand really how students just did not want to be forced to do something like that, right? I mean, I really figured this will be a simple thing, right? The goal for me is to get the message out as broadly as I can. Um, I'm really simply asking them to click the, you know, we'll say, you know, post button, right? People don't want to do that, right? They, they want to control the content that is, that, that's on their Facebook page or that they're tweeting, right? They don't want to have somebody else controlling it for them. So there was a lot of resistance for it. So the second year, we made it optional, right? So optional, but you got, I think, five extra points if you were to post it or tweet it. And you can see, right, we had fewer players and, you know, three and a half times the amount of, of tweets. So it was really interesting to, to sort of back off that and see, and see the engagement increase and the, and, and the willingness to participate increase. Um, I think this is fairly self-explanatory, right? Uh, but this is a, a, a brief overview on the, the Facebook versus Twitter. And you can see they're, they're fairly close, right? Uh, going forward, I think our goal will be to add you know, some of the other social media outlets that people use. Um, this was just something that we could develop fairly easily. Once we got it in place, honestly, we'd focus more on kind of improving the game than trying to figure out how to, how to engage people through other mediums, because we know these are, the, these are the most common ones right now. Um, the social media piece, right, reach is really important to us, and that's something that we, that we spent a fair amount of time on. So, you know, the, the simply measured site, and there's a variety of these things, right? There's Social Bro. There's a whole bunch of places that you can measure sort of social media engagement. Um, the basic number that we've used is, you know, people have about 200 followers between this, you know, this age range, right, 18 and 21. So if you look at the, some basic math, you know, 184 people um, played at least a module and posted um, about 200 followers. So depending on how you want to look at it, if you, even if you say only 20% of the people actually may have looked at what people posted, we reached somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,300 people, right? Um, assuming that every single person they, they you know, looked at it, then we got you know, significantly better engagement, but clearly we know that that's not true. Um, but we know that even with a small amount of people, a small, a small pool of people actually playing the game, we have an opportunity now to try to reach more people, and that's worth it to me, right? So we ran a game, if you, if you notice, right, I think this is, there you go. This is the six-week game. Um, on April 14th of this year, we, we decided to run a spring, a spring game, and we debated a, a lot about, you know, how long to do it, right? We had gone, we had gone anywhere between one week, and we, we never made it to six. We were going to do about four. We really found it challenging in the spring semester to find a four-week period where there wasn't some other distraction, right, midterms or spring break or something like that that would, that would distract from the game. So ultimately, um, we decided to do it in one week and literally do a module per day. So we're basically trying to get the same, the same amount of content out, uh, but in a much shorter time frame, right? Um, let me just pop here really quickly. So we had 181 people play at least a module, right? So if you go back to the other one, it was 184. We had 181 people play. Um, the engagement was, was good. We had 320 you know, tweets, 316 people versus, I think it was 564, if I remember our numbers correctly. Um, you know, 181 users, we had 50 people play through it far enough to get to the grand prize. So it really, it was, it, was, it was less work for us. It wasn't significantly less, right? You still have to do all your advertisements. You still have to distribute your posters. You still have a lot of that work. Um, but the amount of time that we had to concentrate on it was less. The amount of time the students had to concentrate on it was less. We got the same content out there. We have, I believe, the, you know, as good a participation and as good a reach, and it kind of ends quicker. So I think going forward, we'll, we'll certainly do this in the spring. We may do a you know, two-week game come October you know, for, for Security Awareness Month, right? Uh, but I don't think we'll go down the road to doing a four- or six-week game again because I don't think that it, that, that it actually that we need to. Um, and if you look, we, have, we whoops, wrong button. We've got a very similar, you know, I think it was 7,300 roughly before, and you know, 7,200 for a one-week game. All the numbers that we see, I think, really tell us that we should just sort of continue down this path and try to improve a shorter version. Um, 
So what went well, right? The, certainly the partnerships that we've developed over the last year have been really effective. It's, it's, made, it's made it easier for us. Um, the, it, it's reduced some of the potential competition because I knew there were some people out there trying to do it. Um, it's certainly given, given the security office exposure, which has been great, and a broader exposure, right, to a group of people that, you know, isn't my, isn't my, my most significant security risk, um, but I think being in higher ed, we have an opportunity and, uh, and kind of a duty to educate, right? I mean, my, my job just can't be focused on, you know, data protection and, you know, all the associated risks there. Um, to the degree that I can educate students, I think that, you know, that's my responsibility. So, um, so that's really been great. The, we're seeing growth in players, which I think is a positive. Um, more players are completing more modules. So even in, the, even in that one week uh, session, we had more people make it at least you know halfway through than we did in, in, in other times, right? And I think partly that's due to the fact that it's a shorter game and they can keep their attention on it a little bit better. Um, we developed some some back end administration, so it's now much easier to add content and, and sort of modify questions and do things like that. So now I can actually hand this to a student and simply say, you know, here's the you know five basic steps you need to do to add content or modify things, and they can do that easily, right? Where before it was all you know, MySQL backend, and you need, I needed a, an actual admin to do the work. So, you know, th those days are gone. Um, unfortunately, I think I took my what went poorly slide out, and I'm going to, so I'll, I'll speak to that, you know, out of fairness. Um, I think to date, you know, as much, of the, as much marketing as we've done, I think there's got to be a better way to do it, right? Because for, the, for an institution our size and the participation that we've had, um, yeah, I feel we must be doing something wrong, right? We're not reaching people uh, effectively enough. Um, I think one of the other issues that we've got is the, the, the program as it's designed right now doesn't extend itself to our branch campuses. So we've got our main, our main campus and stores, but then we've got a, you know, a decent sized population in the, in the five other locations that, that I can't really reach very well, right? So we've designed the scoring to enable those students to to participate in the, in the online portion of it and be eligible for the grand prize. But the reality is um, there are points that are awarded for completing the scavenger hunt. And so I think it, you know, it, 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 it provides a disincentive for those students because they realize it's, it's gonna be challenging for them to actually go through and, and, and kind of win the game. Um, another issue that we've got, and, and, this, and this is a, a huh. um, and this is another, this is definitely an issue. There we go. You can see I'm incredibly technical. So, um, the uh, one of the other issues that we have is uh, I lost my train of thought trying to plug my, my laptop back in, but I'll but I'll come back to that then. Um, so so I, I think there's some things that we definitely have to fix though. With, oh, so there we go. The the scoring. Right now we're capped, so there is a maximum amount of points that you can earn if you were to do everything. So every time that we run this we've got a tie. And we, we have been drawing for the grand prize. We need to find a way that people can, can truly differentiate themselves if they want to. Because there, you know, every time that there's you know, 300 people or 500 people or whatever, you definitely have 30 or 40 of them who are go-getters, right? So you have a bunch of people who, you know, who play a little bit and participate some, but then you've got a group of people who want to win. And we haven't provided them a good opportunity to simply win, right? It, to play the game to its, to its completion and then actually get your grand prize based on a drawing, I think is kind of a bummer. And we really have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, I think we'll probably experiment with some sort of random opportunities throughout the game to, to earn points. Maybe some real, some time-based things where, you know, we'll, we'll announce at noon and if you don't answer with, you know, within five minutes or something, right? Uh, you, you won't have an opportunity to win points. Possibly we'll do something where points degrade. So, you know, you start off with, you know, 20 potential points, and if you answer within the first hour, you get the full 20, and then, you know, any time after that, it, it degrades. Um, it's been more of a coding exercise, which is why we haven't done it yet. So we thought about this a little while ago. Um, I think that that could work. And I think the, the benefit to us there would be if you really have these random opportunities to earn points, I think you'll actually stay a little bit more engaged in the game, which is the hope. So we'll probably, we'll probably look to design that in, in the upcoming session. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see some, you know, some, some benefit out of that. Um, I probably, I, I might be a little bit ahead here, but the, the site is GitHub, Yukon ISO Husky Hunt, if you're looking to download it. Um, we're going to create a wiki, hopefully, with all the training materials that we've actually got. 
Um, I'll come back to this because I think there's one. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of future plans that I want to that I want to deal with as well. So, uh, but I'll leave the second slide up because I can I can speak to all that. The so, you know, it was mentioned at the beginning that we created a you know higher ed security council in Connecticut. There's about 24 higher ed institutions, and my hope there is that we can actually develop, and so far I've had, I've had some interest, but I, I haven't had anybody commit yet. Um, I'm hoping to do an, an, an inter-university or inter-college challenge, right, where you actually then can try to start to leverage some school spirit in this whole thing and say, listen, represent UConn, right? Don't just win for yourself. Or there'll be an opportunity to win for yourself, but represent the university against, you know, Yale or against Quinnipiac or whatever it is. And there'll be, a little, there'll be some challenges there simply because, uh, you know, the size differences, right? Quinnipiac is, is smaller, right, than UConn. So we'll have to probably do it based on percentages. But I see some real opportunities there to actually, over, over the Security Awareness Week, leverage a, you know, an inter-university competition. And I think that could really be, that could really be fun, and especially because I think, you know, we have a head start, so we should, we're bound to win. But um, uh, so that's one thing I definitely want to do. I want to figure out a way to train faculty and staff using this. So we've put effort into the, into the tool so far. And, you know, we're, we are typically opposed to mandatory training at the university. We've got some mandatory ethics trainings and things like that. But, you know, I, to date, I've had no success in getting a mandatory security awareness training program in place. Um, but I do have a variety of support from, you know, some, you know, the, the CFO and, and some of the different VPs where I think I could actually do that, that sort of interdepartment competition concept within UConn, right? So where I'm not actually forcing anybody to do it and mandating it. And, and there's downsides to that too, right? If you get to, if you, if you start mandating and then you have people who are non-compliant, you have to figure out what the, what the ramifications of that are. And I'm, and I'd rather avoid that for now. Um, I'm really interested in trying to get people to do this willingly. If I can get people to do this across the department and actually find some sort of prize for that department, which shows the greatest participation or the greatest involvement, um, I'd like to do that. So I'm hopeful that I can actually you know, pull that off. Um, the, one of the, we, we did put on there that our future plan would be two hunts per year. So we've done that. This is the first year that we've done that. Um, I fully expect to continue down that road, um, but I do think we'll do, we'll do shorter hunts because I think it actually, you know, it's certainly, it certainly looks like it is as effective and, you know, and is less work. So, and, and that's the end of my presentation. So, um, and that gives a, you know, hopefully an overview and hopefully, you know, one or two of you think this is good enough that you actually want to try and download it and use it. So, um, is there any, are there any questions? Mm, gotcha. Okay, kind of like, so let me, I'll, I'll paraphrase that, right? So your question is, how do you keep those students who are actually, who are doing this as part of their class, right, not ones you're paying, uh, how do you keep them engaged after the class is done, right, after they've received their grade? Um, so this answer is going to be terrible, because I would think it's going to be, I don't know yet, right? This is the first session, the first time that I've actually had an opportunity to work with them. Um, I don't know what your experience has been. I can, I can say that I know the faculty member wants to, um, leverage this over multiple semesters. So they, they treat it as a cohort in, in, in our environment. So the same class is going to move uh, from across multiple years. So I think the idea there would be simply that we give it to one cohort and we let them kind of run with it. And I think the opportunity for me there would be, you know, I don't have to keep continually train people on what the concept is and, you know, have all these new ideas that may or may not actually um, sort of dovetail with what I want to do conceptually. Once you have that one group working on it, I'm hopefully they'll, they'll keep doing it. So I think that's the expectation there. So, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what have you? I know this is student centric, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's a great idea. What have, what are you doing for staff and faculty? <laughs> what creative ideas do you have for that? Yeah. So the, um, so the creative part is the, is the challenging part of your question, right? Yeah. Um, so for faculty and staff, you know, we we we've got the sand securing the human stuff, right? Uh, we've broken that down into a variety of different sort of course modules depending on what the business unit is, right? So we, so we definitely do that. Um, 
We also leverage that, that same training curriculum for anybody who needs access to data. So we've got, you know, the, the data custodians group and our, and our um, um, data classification model, right? So depending on, on what your needs are, we'll have people go through that training. Um, I do a lot of in-person training, essentially, where I'll, I'll visit uh, schools or colleges or departments and, and do some specific security awareness training. We, this is a, this is a whole other topic, but I'll, I'll spend one second on it. We created a program internally called Secure U, uh, Secure with the letter U, the university. And the, func the, the goal of that really was, was almost 100% focused on the end user workstation and PII remediation uh, initially. But then as the program grew, um, it became a much, a much larger project around sort of Active Directory consolidation, rebinding, centralizing some of the work, um, file services migration. There's a whole variety of things that, that were part of that program. And we, we, came, we became very systematic about it. So every single department that we, that we worked with, uh, part of it was a two-hour training session uh, that, either, that either I or one of my colleagues would do. And, it, and that was really valuable. And I think we ended up doing maybe 30 departments to date. So we've been doing it for about a year. Um, so there's a lot of in-person stuff that we do. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can leverage this. I mean, I think that that'll be the next step for me is to try to figure out a way to, to kind of keep information flowing but using this medium if I can. So, uh, so I don't know if that's very creative necessarily, you know, probably more pragmatic, but. I mean, in our university, we've just never, we've always targeted it towards the staff. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and to be fair, I think staff is probably the most valuable place to, you know, to spend your efforts, right? That's where a lot of your risk is. And I don't know, quite honestly, if I would have started this if I didn't actually have some, some seed money, right? And, and it felt like a shame to, to not take advantage of that. And once we came up with the idea, right, ideas are easy, right? Then all of a sudden you realize how challenging it is to implement. And it took a while to get this, this program off the ground. And, and certainly the first time we ran it, it was, um, it was not nearly as smooth as, as it is now. But... You know, it's, kind of, it's been kind of fun at the same time. So, are there any other questions? Yes, Jason, I have a couple. Um, first, the prizes that you mentioned yeah. that you gave, were they, um, were they donated? Did you have a budget for that? How did you work that? So the first, uh, the first year we did it, they came out of that, uh, out of the foundation pool. Um, since then, we funded them out of, out of my budget from the, from the ISO. Um, it, you know, it's about $1,000, roughly, after all is said and done. So it's not a fortune. Um, and, and we distribute it, right? So you've got your grand prize, which is pretty significant. Your second prize, I think, is, a, is $100. Um, so then you've, you've got a fair amount of money to play with as it relates to, you know, ice cream and, and things like that, right? And then clearly the vendors now are, are providing stuff. And it's interesting the things that kids want. I mean, we had... Uh, you know, Sam's, which is like the, the little convenience store on campus, um, gave away, literally they gave away employee shirts, right? So it says Sam's on it, it's red, it's, it, you know, fairly unattractive. And we had kids lining up for, for t-shirts. And you think, you know, can't, it's like a dollar, Do you, but, but they really wanted it, right? So, you know, kind of anything free, right? We've done, we've done some of your basic, you know, um, fluorescent sunglasses and those types of things, right, as, 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 as sort of little treats, um, iPhone holders, you know, general trinkety stuff. But, you know, we had, we had a, um, a tie. we didn't have a tie for our grand prize, but one of the kids said, listen, I, you know, I had the same points and you just drew it and that kind of stinks. And, you know, so the $500 for the grand prize, we gave this kid an iPhone holder. He said, yeah, that's great. So, you know, I think you, having stuff is, is helpful. Yeah, I can, I can tell you that. Uh... Uh, my students that helped me with security awareness one year, they said, don't give away bookstore, give right. away uh, Walmart gift cards right. or Starbucks coffees or <laughs> right. things like that. Yeah, and the, and the coffee goes a long way too, right? Yeah, so we'll, I mean, we'll keep working with Dunkin' Donuts and you know, the associated caffeine vendors. So. so my second question is, I always got dinged on um, online distance students. How can they participate? Right. Um, do you have any plans or yeah. any ideas about that? Um, so there's, so it's essentially for me, it'd be the same way that I think I want to address the remote, the re remote campuses, right? Um, we have thought about leveraging the directors of those campuses to actually distribute stuff for us, but you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident that'll be challenging. So we may try and move part of the scavenger hunt at least online and actually start looking for things that we place, you know, different places on the internet, which might be interesting. 
Um, we could just do a security awareness piece, which is solely um, you know, online focused and not try to do the scavenger hunt. But, but honestly, if I can avoid that, I would rather. Right? I, think that, I think the scavenger hunt is kind of fun. Um, so to the degree that we then maybe embed things. And, and there's, some, there's some opportunity there, right? So if I can drive people to different locations, uh, I'll call it on the internet, but likely it'll be things like you know, university policy, right? Or you know, uh, residential life information or things that I think would be relevant to the students anyway. I think we may actually do that. And there's some opportunities for me to, to, to work more closely with our student affairs area to get some of that done. So I could see some, I could see some, some, some things there. Great, thank you. Sure. Is there anything else? Yeah, no? Okay. Um, well, I appreciate everybody's time this morning. I hope you found it valuable. Hopefully, you know, somebody downloads it. And if you do and you need some help or have any questions, please you know, feel free to let me know, and I'm, and I'm happy to answer those. But uh, thanks, and enjoy the rest of the conference.